This is the Open University. I've gone completely mad. I'm on a boat and I'm not on a boat. I'm narrating this and I'm actually here in the real scene. Uh, what does it mean to travel and to lose yourself in travel? That's the question I'm asking today and I'm going to show you some slides in a slideshow as I usually do. Uh, this is the end of my Korea trip uh, and the beginning of my Japan trip. So I've had a month in Seoul and then headed down to Gwangju to see the Gwangju Biennale and then uh, to Busan, which is a much more interesting city than I've given it credit for, a much bigger city as well. Uh, and um, I spent more time this time in, Guan in Busan than I had ever done. Uh, and sat in more cafes and looked at more clothes and uh, went to more markets and smelt the fish and saw these strange islands which are poking out of the sea like uh, fantasy islands with a fantasy city behind it, phantasmagorical buildings scraping the sky. And um, Korea was a blast, I have to say. It was really um, full of color, taste and smell. And um, some art as well. There was a thing called the Galleries Art Fair, which was a bit disappointing. Uh, but the Gwangju Biennale was good. Uh, a typical Western guilty biennial um, transferred to Asia. Nobody there, more staff than visitors the day we went. Soft and weak like water was the curatorial concept. I came away thinking um, that uh, art used to have to transcend the banality of everyday life, but now it has to transcend the banality of its own curation sometimes, because everything was um, post-colonial, decolonial, this, that, uh, identitarian. More of the gypsy artists we saw at the uh, Venice Biennale last year, and. Um, but art manages, it rises to the occasion of transcending the straitjacket of those ideas, which are about guilt mostly, and about how uh, visual art might become a redemptive site for uh, the misdeeds of the past, of the West's past in particular. So it's a Western perspective of hair shirtery. <laughs> but um, the fantastic thing is that however restrictive your curatorial concept is, you still get some wonderful art. So um, that's what I go to these things for, and I, I was um, happy to... Actually, we came on a Monday to Guangzhou, and I hadn't checked that the biennial was open. It was actually closed on Monday, so we had to pack it all into a Tuesday morning before catching our train to Busan. And um, But it was a rainy day, and it was a good day to be inside a, a big sort of convention center and to see the uh, biennial. Andeth was showing us around on the, our last day in Seoul. Andeth, who's an artist or graduate, actually she was a, a design graduate from one of the art schools in Seoul. Uh, and she's been my kind of um, interestingness magnet every time I've gone to Seoul since uh, 2011, essentially. Well, I came to Seoul as an art, a visual artist myself because I had some installation cassette players in uh, a place called Arco Museum, uh, which was part of a group show about love. And uh, I just narrated some stories and had them running on cassettes in little corners of the gallery. But uh, I'm not really a visual artist, but I, I, I do respect the visual. I was actually going to have this week's Open University, because last week's was so articulate and so word-based with Colin Marshall. I was going to have one this time, which was just images and sounds. And the sort of delightful disorientation you get from travel could happen in a video too where it's not preaching at you, it's not talking at you, it's a walk in the dark, it's uh, unfamiliar shapes. And I think what I'm drawn to when I take pictures is kind of unfamiliar bursts of color and shape and form, and especially in Asia where I don't quite understand what's going on still to this day. I was unsure how Japan would strike me this time coming back. I thought uh, it might be um, either t throat tighteningly nostalgic or it would be uh, just kind of the same old domestic Japan that I spent most of my 50s living in, 
because uh, I was living in Osaka for eight years. Um, but actually, it was probably more the latter. It felt pretty normal. We, we took the jet foil Beetle Ferry, which is run by JR, the railway company, from Busan. It's a very, very fast kind of bus over the water where you, you rise up off the water and zoom across it. Last time I took that, of course, David Bowie had just died, and I, I learned about his death on the ferry, so it's got some strange resonances. It was a very pearly, gloomy, luminescent day that day, 2016, and uh, this time it was smooth as, as, as a bowling green across the water, and it was uh, sunny, so it was a much more joyful experience. And the rocks that you, you saw floating about, weren't actually floating on the deck. That was just a sort of optical illusion that I added to add a sense of strangeness and, and, and delight and inf- unfamiliarity to the scene that's been that death um, in Seoul. With a, with a hoodie that Anne Death made herself, uh, she painted these uh, motifs on. This was some galleries she was showing. There's a lot of exhibitions about the development of Incheon. Uh, Incheon, which is a kind of city in its own right, just to the west of Seoul which is developing, on the one hand, sort of luxury new housing, but on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, um, quite uh, poor, run-down, traditional housing, these tiny little houses in rows that you get. Um, So there were a lot of exhibitions about uh, how Incheon has developed. And... uh, But so, yeah, Japan... Japan really just is still Japan does Japan still stand where Japan stood yes she does there are still canals there's still a kind of milky luminescence a milky uh, a sense of gentleness and safety which Korea doesn't have especially because of the cars which are like beady eyed cockroaches lurking around with their tinted glass windows Um, you can't even glare at the drivers in, in, in Korea because they're hidden uh, whereas in Japan, all the cars, these little upright uh, b- water bugs, really, that just scattle and skittle about. And, um, but they're very, very considerate and cautious in the small streets of the inner city. So you don't really get the same sense of menace uh, or of a constant attack and constant filthy air and all the rest of it that you get. in um, Cars are, are filthy cockroaches, really, and we need to rid cities of them, get those things to scuttle out somewhere else. But uh, Japan is a place where, I don't know, I, I do get a sense of um, gentleness and of, or also a geriatric sense, which is still kind of present in Japan. Um, these were street scenes around the, um, one of the markets in uh, Busan. Uh, and actually, Gwangju was interesting because we did find the trendy district in Gwangju, although most of it was shut on Monday. Uh, the cafe that we went to said it was open on Google Maps, but uh, they just closed down the day before. <laughs> the day before had been their last day. It's that that thing there with the um, the rather rundown front. Oh, this was some. Um, this was uh, a, a great piece of um, sound art in the Guangzhou Biennale. Uh, it's not Kadaratia, um Tariq um, Atui, who makes uh, sound installation works kind of mechanical music making stuff that's based on local crafts so he he came to Guangzhou and studied what people are making in the workshops there Uh, the usual kind of quotient of um, videos and installations and things but painting as well some kind of nice painting and um, yeah so we we zipped from Guangzhou which as a city was a bit uh, bit grim in some ways uh, the bus rides were particularly bone shaking uh, to Busan which is uh, <coughs> it's more of a Mediterranean feeling and it's got sort of uh, painted favelas uh, up the hillside and it's got huge beaches and a bit like Barcelona in some ways and um, then coming back to Japan the buildings are much more low rise obviously and it's sort of a perverse side to Japan, we were staying right next to a sex district in um, Fukuoka and um, the coffee, the cafes are not so interesting I have to say in these smaller Japanese towns. We came to um, Kumamoto on the train today uh, to see Kumamon who is a a sacred monster probably going to follow in the footsteps of Billiken 
who is the uh, god of things as they ought to be, but started out as a QP mayonnaise mascot. So the, the, Japan has this amazing ability to transform anything into something sacred. So even commercial, or particularly commercial, mascots can become gods. And in Kumamoto, because Kumamon is the symbol of the local council now, basically all the signs and toilets and things like that are feature are spoken, apparently spoken to you by this bear, this mascot who started out, I think, as a, a commercial mascot for orange growing for the orchards and the um, orange uh, manufacturing industry of Kumamoto because it's known for its citrus fruits. But uh, he has become a kind of divinity here. So we, we paid homage at all the shrines, uh, all the locations. Unfortunately, one of them was closed for renovation and maintenance. But uh, I'm sure he's, in about a hundred years, Kumamon will be revered. And, um, well, that's probably all I'm going to tell you. Uh, so see you next time. Urban University.